Well, I've been charged with talking about health care and health care issues. And some of you heard other presentations that I've done on this subject over time. This is going to be a, a slightly different presentation. Uh, we now have a genuine health care reform bill that has passed. Most of my previous lectures on this were previous to the, the health care bill. And so now I get the privilege of speaking in, in hindsight or retrospect. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, he says, well, will this health care bill work? And my answer was, well, that's not the point. And by the way, it won't work. But that's really not the point. Uh, my subtitle for this talk on health care reform really is probably wrong answers, wrong questions. And I'm going to submit that when we decide issues of public policy, we can make decisions based upon two philosophical decision-making processes. We can make decisions based on what we call pragmatics. You know, you hear that said all the time. I heard a politician just the other day on the radio, someone asked him if he was liberal or conservative, and he says, well, I'm neither. I'm just pragmatic. And pragmatics just means that you make your decisions case by case on some sort of standard, usually a utilitarian standard. Now, if you're not familiar with the term utilitarianism or utilitarian, Modern utilitarian uh, thought really comes out of uh, uh, John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham and a few of those philosophers. Their mindset is that to make a decision, you evaluate the pros and the cons, you run the mathematic formula, you do the comparisons, and you go with whichever decision gives you the best net benefit. Debaters, you guys are familiar with the idea of net benefits. <clears throat> and so that's utilitarian or what I would call pragmatic decision making. Now, we can contrast that to the idea of principle-based decision-making. And principle-based decision-making says that before you even look at the pragmatics, before you evaluate the utilitarian view, you need to see if there's underlying principles at work. Uh, for example, um, if Carl and I were to decide we need a little extra cash, and so we think, well, we could raise some money maybe by doing a bank heist. You know, all those other guys that rob banks, they're not as smart as we are. <clears throat> you know, we could do this much better. And so, being the good economist, though, we need to know if it's going to be cost effective to rob this bank. So we do a study. We analyze how much money is in the bank. We analyze the, the probability of being caught, the density of police officers at a certain time of the day, how much cash there's likely to be. You know, okay, what's the cost of our time if we do get caught and go to jail? You know, how many years, time, and, and money does that cost? If we get away with it, what's our net profit? How much do we gain? We have this great formula. And Carl and I could have this formula where we could say, here is the formula for making the decision. All we have to do is do the research, plug in the numbers, and now we know whether or not we should hold up the Wells Fargo Bank on the corner. <clears throat> well, we could be doing well going through this pragmatic process. But all of a sudden, Anthony comes up and says, wait a minute, you guys. <clears throat> Isn't there another issue at stake here? We say, well, we think we've got the right formula. And Anthony says, no, 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 not the formula. He says, is there something wrong with robbing a bank? Does that violate any moral or ethical principle? And Carl and I would say, ah, we didn't think about that. <clears throat> I mean, that is the last thing, of course, that we would, would think about. And say, yeah, maybe, maybe robbing a bank is wrong. Yeah, there's that Eighth Commandment thing that says, thou shalt not steal. Well, the idea of principle versus pragmatics <clears throat> is that kind of a comparison. You see, in public policy, our political leaders, what they typically do is they jump right to the utilitarian analysis. They jump right to the pragmatics. They skip over the principle part of the decision. Now, I'm not arguing against utilitarian thinking completely. There are decisions where there's not an ethical concern. If there's not an ethical concern, then you do use the pragmatics. You know, we're trying to decide if we want to re change the room, we want to put hardwood floor or carpet. <clears throat> well, as far as I know, there's not a moral consideration between hardwood floors and carpet. We look at the durability, the wear, the cost, make a pragmatic decision. That's fine. But we always need to make sure that there's not a moral element first. Because if there's a moral or a principle or an ethical element, then we should make the decision on that and the pragmatics don't matter any longer. Well, when it comes to health care reform, <clears throat> we need to do the same thing, really all public policy. And so what I did, I looked at the health care bill um, that we've just passed. Uh, I shouldn't say we, because as near as I can tell, I didn't vote for it. Um, <laughs> you know, nobody even asked me. That, that's the crazy thing. Uh, I kind of expected Diane Feinstein to say, Mike, you know, what's your opinion on this thing? But she hardly ever checks with me. Uh, we're going to work on that. So I looked at some of these things, and I, I wanted to take a principal approach <clears throat> to the health care reform bill. Well, 
here I, I started looking at the idea of, of liberty and property rights, and these were two issues I wanted to look at. Because if I was to walk down the street and force someone at gunpoint to do something against their will, what would happen to me? I would hope I'd go to jail. Now, this is Oakland. I'm not sure. In Modesto, I would go to jail, <coughs> okay? So if I, if I take my gun out and I want to force someone to make a contribution to my favorite cause, uh, I would suspect if I did that at gunpoint that I might end up in jail. Either that or the other person would shoot back. Either way, I've got a negative consequence. But let's look at some of the issues. I've broken down the issues of the health care bill into four violations, and I have examples of each of them. Uh, the first is a violation of both the freedom and the property rights of the insurance companies that provide health insurance. And there are numerous violations for these companies. Now, keep in mind, I, I'm skipping some principles here that maybe should have been dealt with first, but like Greg mentioned, when you do a short presentation, you have to do some assumptions. I'm going to assume that this audience is an audience that understands the idea of property rights. <clears throat> when you own something, you should have a right to continue to own it unless you have violated someone else's rights. And if you own property, you should have the right to control how that property is used, so long as you don't use it to the detriment of someone else. Well, let's look at these four issues, the first being the freedom or the rights of the insurance companies. If you own a business, uh, do you not have the right to decide how you're going to organize that business? You know, uh, McDonald's gets to choose whether or not they're going to sell quarter pounders or eighth pounders or sixteenth pounders. You know, if they want to come out with a thirty-second pounder, you know, little mini hamburger, it would be within their right to do that. But wait a minute, we have a government now that's going to regulate how businesses engage in business. For example, under the health care reform bill, which, by the way, the technical name is the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Uh, it's the P-P-A-C-A, -A, something like that. Uh, that's an acronym that we've probably become more accustomed to over time, unfortunately. Uh, there's a provision there that will limit the ability of insurance companies to reject a customer. If people come to them, they, uh, and there's these stair-stepped periods of implementation, there will be a point where they're not able to reject a new customer. Now, I think an insurance company ought to be able to reject someone based on risk, based on practices, based on anything they choose. If they own the company, that should be their prerogative. So we lose that liberty for the, for the insurance companies. Uh, we also have the insurance companies losing their liberty to determine their overhead. Under this act, the federal government will regulate how much administrative overhead an insurance company can have. Now, what are the business in America do we regulate that? I mean, we complain sometimes about top-heavy companies, especially if you're a stockholder. <clears throat> but is that the role of the government to determine how much administrative staff we have? By the way, can anybody in this room tell me what the optimal percentage of administration is for a health insurance company? Does anybody here know? I doubt any of us knows. Do you suppose anyone in Washington, D.C. knows? Well, apparently they do because they've established it. And so health insurance companies will have to operate <clears throat> in a certain range of overhead. So, admittedly, we have a problem here. Uh, also, thirdly, is that now insurance companies lose their privacy on internal matters. They have to disclose salaries and information that would otherwise be held privately. So we have an infringement on the, ins the insurance industry and their freedoms and their liberties. Now, we all hate the insurance companies, so maybe it's okay if we infringe their liberty, right? That's kind of the modern mindset. Well, let's look at the freedom of consumers. The health care bill violates the liberty and the property rights of health care consumers. For example, I would think there's an inherent right for all of us to not purchase a product. But guess what? There's a point that kicks in, and there are a couple of exceptions I will grant, but in general, Americans will be forced to buy health insurance. If you are over a certain income level, you are required to pay and buy health insurance or you will be fined by the federal government. Uh, by the way, guess which agency the federal government looks like might be enforcing this? The Internal Revenue Service, our favorite federal agency. <clears throat> so now we lose the liberty not to purchase a product. Well, some would say, but wait a minute, shouldn't everybody have health insurance? Well, I have a question. Should everybody have health insurance? Well, if we believe in the paternalistic idea that the state knows best, if the state determines that's best for us, then I guess so. You know, it's interesting to me when we hear these, these statistics about how many uninsured Americans there are. 
And I'll grant that there are poor people who don't have health insurance. But the data they give you never tells you how many of those uninsured are poor people. I have a question. If you're Bill Gates, <clears throat> is it a problem for you personally to not have health insurance? Would there be a medical procedure or medical condition that would exceed the resources <clears throat> of Bill Gates? Now, some of you may have heard Rush Limbaugh was in the hospital in Hawaii, uh, was over the holidays or something. And uh, I'm not sure what his health insurance situation is, but apparently, as the rumor has it, uh, he paid cash for that. Is it a problem if Rush Limbaugh doesn't have health insurance? Who is it to say that someone can or cannot afford their health care? You know, the idea that we have to have insurance Again, it's government making those decisions for us. So now the consumer is forced to buy a product. You are forced to, um, matter of fact, now we're regulating what kind of products we purchase. Uh, consumers will not be able to choose, say, a high deductible insurance plan. They're required to choose plans that meet a certain set of government criteria. So we have a violation of the freedom of the insurance companies. We have a violation of the freedom and the liberty of the consumer. Let's look at a third category. And this is just a random one, but there's a lot of random things in this bill. I picked this one at random, but the freedom of restaurants to run your restaurant as you see fit. You may not know this, but in the health care bill is a requirement that restaurants now have to disclose, even uh, small restaurants, the nutritional standards of all their menu items. So the little mom and pop taco shop in the corner, they have to get a chemical analysis of their food so they know how much sodium, how much sugar, how much fat, how much grease is in that. Now, if I'm willing to go to Jose's Taco Shop, and I like Jose's Tacos, and if we have a voluntary exchange, is there any role for government to regulate how we exchange money in tacos? Well, I don't think so. Our founding fathers wouldn't have thought so, but here we have this in the health care bill. The fourth category I want to mention with health care, and there are others I could do, but that's the freedom of the taxpayer. Because the health care bill <clears throat> is designed to redistribute wealth. Because there are people that can't afford health care, supposedly, right? So we're going to tax other people to provide health care for those who can't afford it. So we're redistributing wealth from one person to another. Well, by doing that, we are taking away the liberty, the property, of those that we're taxing. Now, I, I would love to do this study, and maybe someone will finance the, the research. I would love to go and do a survey of America and find out what percentage of Americans think they are going to get more for less with the health care bill. Do you think you're going to get something for nothing? Because if people think they're going to get something for nothing, if they think they're going to get more services for less money, then what is the corollary? What is the logical other side of the coin? If some people are getting more and paying less, what has to happen? Somebody else has to get less and pay more. I mean, it's the simple mathematic formula, right? I mean, one, what's on one side of the equal sign has to equal what's on the other side of the equal sign. Unless somehow you believe that government management of our health care is going to provide increased efficiencies. Is there anyone here that believes that delivery will be more efficient? Well, if you don't think delivery will be more efficient, the only way we can provide more care to the poor or any other class is to charge somebody more money, right? So obviously, we're taking money from one and giving to another, another violation of liberty on principle. You see, I don't believe that the health care bill passes muster from a utilitarian perspective. But that is not the primary question. The primary question should be first, does this bill violate any moral or ethical standards? <clears throat> and I think it does. It's stealing. It's taking from the rich and giving to the poor. It's taking away the liberty of restaurants. It's taking away the freedom of the consumer. It's taking away the freedom of the health care industries, the, the insurance companies. That is the standard by which we ought to judge it. Now, only if there was no ethical or moral violations, then we would study the utility of it. But that should be a secondary consideration. Now, I will just give one little set of analysis on utility for all of you. And again, these abbreviated sessions, we can't go into a lot of depth. But here, here's just a quick utilitarian perspective. And if we had more time, I'd give you the <clears throat> supply and demand graphs. But if you picture the idea of supply and demand, and most of you understand that, supply is the ability of a producer to produce a product. So who are the suppliers of healthcare in America? Give me an example. 
<clears throat> Who supplies health care? What category? Hospitals? Good. What else? <clears throat> okay. Kaiser and insurance companies, HMOs or providers? Pharmaceutical companies? Doctors? Nurses? These are the producers. They provide the supply, right? Then on the other side of the equation, we have the consumers. They are the demand. <clears throat> consumers, that's you and I. Now, the price of health care seems to be the root problem, right? I mean, that's what we're complaining about. Health care prices are high. Well, if you understand supply and demand, you understand that price is simply a reflection of where the supply curve and the demand curve cross, <clears throat> right? We can reduce the price of health care by doing one of two things. We can reduce demand. All we have to do is get half of you not to go to the doctor when you're sick, and price would go down. Or we could increase supply. We could double the number of doctors, hospitals, and nurses, and price would go down. <clears throat> you wouldn't have to double it. It would be proportional. A 5% increase in supply would have a, you know, an effect. But do you guys understand that? The way to drop price is either to reduce demand or increase supply. There is no other way to change price unless you can get efficiencies. And I think most of us here would understand that the private sector is always going to be more efficient. So at least for the sake of this discussion, we can take efficiency off the table. So if we know the only way to get a price decrease is by those two formulas. Let me ask you a question. When the gov government introduces a new program to provide health care to the poor, like the Medicare program in 1968, <clears throat> or the Medicaid program also passed in 1968, those programs provided health care at no or little cost to the elderly and the poor. What did that do to demand? When the government provides more things for people that couldn't afford it before, demand goes up, right? <clears throat> so if that demand goes up, what happens to prices? Prices go up. Is there any wonder that our health care prices have gone up? Now, this new health care bill, we're going to provide more health care for more people that couldn't afford it, have a third party payer. So that's going to do what to demand? That'll further increase demand putting more pressure on price. Now, in a free market, as price goes up, what happens to supply? Nor the suppliers respond, right? <clears throat> Gee, it's more profitable to be a doctor now. So more people go into medicine. Unfortunately, we have a problem. In our system, our supply of doctors and medical schools is regulated. It's not allowed to fluctuate based on the price. <clears throat> the state medical boards and the AMA control how many medical schools there can be, and they also control the number of admissions to medical schools in America. Nursing schools are not as limited, but they're limited as well. So we have all these limitations on the supply that are artificially imposed. So while we're capping the supply, our government policies are increasing demand. What's the effect of price going to be? More escalation of price. Now, as the government takes on more and more of paying the bill, then government's going to have a bigger and bigger bill as the price goes up. And just like the UK and the Netherlands and Canada and every other nation that's moved to more government control of health care, when the government provides more health care, demand increases, price goes up, pretty soon it's prohibitively expensive. So now the government has to find some way to lower demand. Well, they don't lower demand by taking away the benefits. They lower the demand by rationing. And they've got tables and charts that determine who gets which care. They've got it in Canada, they've got it in England, they've got it most of the European nations. They look at your age, your health condition, the procedure you need, and it says yes or no, we'll provide that to you. Do you know in Canada, if you are in one of those excluded categories of care, and the state would normally pay for that, of course, in Canada, uh, if you're in one of those excluded categories, it's against the law for you to pay a doctor out of pocket for that. And it's against the law for that doctor to take payment. Why? Because if they allow people to pay privately, that would increase demand. They're trying to artificially decrease demand by rationing care. And the only way they're rat and they don't call it rationing, of course, but the only way that rationing will keep demand down is if you indeed keep people from buying the care, which means you can't let them even spend their own private money. There's a little bit of utilitarian analysis for you as well, which I think in general, if you follow good principles, the result is you will have the best utility, the best system. <clears throat>